because we have this stubborn belief, crazy to a point, the, the big harvest will come. It's, it's like Noah's Ark in a way that we're just here building because we're waiting for that big rain to come and we can't fault those who don't believe. Hey everyone, this is Miguel and welcome back to episode 2 of the Yellow Pill Podcast. In the Yellow Pill Podcast, we discuss principles on how to be wealthy, healthy, and happy in the modern age. It's an echo to Brad Stolberg's studies, which basically espouse that you can succeed without having to burn yourself out. You can be happy along the way to success. It's not a one or the other thing. And as I try to explore and navigate growing my own business and building my own wealth, I'm documenting my journey from where I am now to where I intend to be. So if you guys noticed, I haven't been uploading. This is actually my second podcast episode. I haven't uploaded in the last six weeks or seven weeks. It's been a busy time, guys. And to be fair with myself and to be frank, I actually prepared three scripts already and I just chunked them. I didn't feel like recording based on those scripts. Three different scripts, three different topics. I've been trying to, to get back to it for a while now and to upload, but I couldn't find myself to finish. And I've prepared two slideshow presentations also, guys. And I didn't record. I just didn't push through with it. The thing is, I wanted to shift from being so prepared to being myself. You know, trying to change the format of the show a bit to reflect my original voice. So instead of shooting, guys, back home, where I had the usual setup in our balcony, I'm now shooting in our room. It's very bare. Uh, you can see the the dirt stains over here. It's part of the main design. I want you to see everything and I want to try to get comfortable in my own voice and to share candidly. Not to exude an air of authority, not to pretend like I know it all, but really just to publicly talk in front of a cam and digress, tear apart concepts that I've been toying with currently and to discuss the problems in real time and the solutions in my head in real time. One of the reasons why I'm doing this is because we're growing in the office, we're growing and we have more lawyers now than we could have ever imagined two to three years ago and it's been a real challenge guys getting everyone on the same page with us principles wise and i think that's what i want to be talking about today you know, the challenges of growing a business the challenges of growing your own firm because apparently it's not not well all businesses are difficult you know, but this episode will be specifically tailored to the challenges of growing your own law firm so uh, i found out i found out because i was listening to alex formosi's podcast the game in one of the episodes, he said that when you're trying to grow a consultancy firm or a law firm, you're actually trying to run a talent management and recruitment business. So you need to attract the right talent. You need to keep them happy with the right system. You need to make sure they're fulfilled, they're earning well. And yeah, that's the, that's the rig that we're running now. Basically, a law firm is a talent management and acquisitions, talent recruitment business. And these are the challenges that I'd like to present with you today. The challenges of growing our law firm and our real estate firm here in the Philippines. But first, maybe some updates are due on this year's developments. On this year's developments. So we started this year, not with a bang, but actually we started off the back of a pretty disappointing year 2022. If you watched the previous episode, the first episode, I discussed a lot on what made it disappointing and what were the adjustments that we made in order to try and start the year strong? So for this year, I think we're, we're able to pivot from last year's a bit of a slack, a bit of an underperforming season, if you might. And on the base of laser focus and patient determination, I think on the partner's level, we have been able to achieve new strides this year. New heights that we unlocked new levels, but... With it comes problems. So uh, I'm going to discuss some of the goals that we set personally and as a firm and how we have achieved some of them and how we are on our way to achieving most of them and the challenges that we are experiencing right now in order to, to find the lesson, try to infuse the principle on how we are trying to come up with a solution for the challenges. And this is also for the benefit, guys, of our senior associates in the firm, our junior associates in the firm, our internal partners, our external partners, our stakeholders. I know access to me has been a bit sparse lately because of my responsibilities outside the office. But in fairness to me, I think from the people who are following us, there's a lack of 
this inquisitive spirit to try to reach out to me and try to learn, try to sap the principles. And one of the challenges actually that I want to discuss today. But before that, priority projects for 2024. I mentioned this in my first episode. First, we wanted to scale LBBF Law and Tierra Pro. So for the law firm, we wanted to recruit 10 new lawyers for this year. And we have just done that. And we are now in the breaking stage of it. And you know, all the problems are coming out. All the adjustments that need to be made are being made or are yet to be made. And yeah, apart from that, the other target that I set was by July, August, I would be starting to recruit 100 new agents to Kiara Pro Realty and Brokerage. So that's a thing. That's a thing. Personally, I wanted a client onboarding system because I'm adopting the role of now being the business development head of the firm. You know, So everybody has to play certain roles, specific roles, because we are now an organization. We are no longer the small ragtag guerrilla group that we were in the past. A lot of us now have more defined specific roles in the firm. Like for example, attorney Joe Bilbao, my partner, handles finance. Attorney Paul Blanco handles the operations. He's actually the managing partner, not me. And Lovelyn Castaneda handles the real estate operations. She's our broker, soon to be appraiser and consultant. And attorney Fiel handles litigation. But um, a bit of a shuffle later on. We will be discussing on that shuffle also later on. Suffice it to say that our goal this year for scaling the law firm and the real estate firm was to hire 10 new lawyers, to recruit 10 new lawyers rather, and to recruit 100 new agents to Tierra Pro Realty. I also wanted to be more consistent with the yellow pill. This is a launch year, guys, so all the adjustments, all the mistakes, and all the tinkering is being made this year. I hope you were patient enough to stick it out with me. This is actually the sixth YouTube episode that I've started, but only the second podcast episode since the first four episodes that I launched were launched under the presumption that short-form content was better. So I tried my best, you know, the usual, the traditional cut. So you edit with music, add as much b as possible, and you try to condense the lesson in like 16, 15 minutes or less. And it was a lot of work. It was fun. I'm doing it myself, guys, by the way. I don't have an editor. And... Yeah, right now, I want to do a deep dive, double down on educational content. And it's going to be more of this, more of just me talking in front of the camera for an hour or half an hour, maybe a bit more than an hour, discussing concepts and trying to express myself and trying to express my thoughts. Because I'm a fan of modern wisdom. I watch almost all of Chris Williamson's releases. Chris, if you ever find your way to this episode, if you're listening, shout out to you. You are my inspiration to start this whole thing. And yeah, uh, I figured out if I had the patience to sit down when I'm driving, when I'm, you know, just relaxing, when I'm in bed, if I have the patience to sit down and actually listen to one hour long, two hour long conversations, then I guess I should be making more of the content that I wish to see. So that's why we're now shifting to long form podcast type YouTube videos. So a bit of that, a bit of the format change is also the reason why there's been delays. Not to make excuses, guys. It is what it is. No? This is the second episode in seven weeks. So sorry for that if you were anticipating this to, be, to have been released a bit earlier. And yeah, look at me now, starting to warm up to the camera. By the way, I shifted the camera as well. It used to be front facing so I could see myself and I could see how long I've been blabbing. But now, just keep this timepiece with me and it's now rear facing. So an attempt to be less conscious, less aware and just talk, you know, share the things that I want to share without the pressure of having to look good or be in the middle of the frame or whatever. Also, English is not my first language. I am Filipino. Uh, Bisaya at that. So listen to my Bisaya, guys. I really want this platform to be accessible to everyone, not just people in my local community, the people in my country, because these ideas are universal, the ideas that I want to share. And also, I don't have the, the mechanism to translate everything. I'm not really doing this to be famous, so I don't need to be very big here. I don't need to like do anything flashy. I don't feel that pressure. I just need guys to express my thoughts, express my ideas. For two main things. The first is really an internal function. So if you are a member of LBBF Law Firm or Tierra Pro, if you are a partner, if you're a senior associate, a lieutenant, a junior associate, a stakeholder, internal partner, an in external partner, and you're watching this, this is principally for you. This is my way of keeping up with the scale, guys, because 
so many people are coming in and I'm really feeling the brunt of not being able to catch up to explain all of our base principles to all of you. So actually, these videos are meant to instruct and to help you understand what we are trying to build, how we operate, and how we are trying to succeed. You know, the very conscious, the very meticulous path, the long road that we are taking towards our group success. And I hope you have enough patience to dedicate time, take the time to watch this because these videos are principally made for you. Uh, the second one is for people who are not within our firm, for the people who just wish to learn about how to start big businesses and how to succeed in life, how to create winning teams, cultivate winning cultures. So at least by watching these videos, you'll get to see the challenges that we face. I will try to be as honest as possible with my thoughts because being honest means being able to talk about real situations and real people, although I won't have to name names. But if you ever fit yourself in one of these situations, please appreciate that we are considering this and we're taking it up as a problem and we're trying to find the solutions so we can move forward together. The second reason, guys, is for all those who are not part of the organization who are watching, I want this to become the magnet. I want you to see us and how we operate. And if it attracts you and you are in our local sphere or maybe international and you would want to work with us for external business or internally or partnerships, then maybe this this will be the platform to attract new clients, new businesses, new partners as well. So those are the two main reasons why I'm doing this. Without further ado, let's proceed. Onto the magnet part. A bit of an update is that yes, we have had our 10 new lawyers and four agents into my 100 agent quota. Uh, the difference was that all of my partners were expecting me to recruit 10 new lawyers over the course of the year. I did something very different and it shook the foundation of the firm. I know even up to now, a lot of people don't agree with me. A lot of the juniors and the seniors don't agree with me. Some of my partners don't agree with me. I'm not trying to explain, but... This is why I did what I did. Hiring 10 new lawyers over the course of a year would be too much for me if I were to onboard and train everyone, you know, one at a time, one at a time. So decided, fuck it, you know, uh, to test the scalability of the system. You always have to break the system. LBBF law has been in service in the business, in the industry for seven going eight years already. And we grew from a tiny office that we started out, we grew to the size that we are today because of this. Because we break systems. As soon as it gets too comfortable, we break them. And we try to push the needle a bit further towards the extreme every time, every time. And we use this breaking and strengthening to surface all the problems, you know, to filter out those who do not believe, to bring problems to the surface, and to strengthen us and to make this our new norm. So I decided... You know, why don't we just do that at the start of the year? Let's take 10 new lawyers as an experiment. Let's break the system and let's run with it for a year. If it works, then we'll do more. If it doesn't work, then we'll dial down a bit and charge it to experience. And this is one of the base principles that we've had as a firm. A lot of the new people don't understand that. We are proceeding according to our targets. The earnings target, the recruitment targets, and the workload targets. I'd say that LBBF is growing at a good, sustainable rate. And right now, we can already start to feel that the organization is a magnet. We are now starting to attract better talent. Uh, we have a good pool of talents already in the firm and a good pool of people externally to the firm but are very interested to join the firm. And in fact, we've let some of them in over the course of this year. We are on the way to having new real estate partners because these are people who must have seen us from afar and said to themselves that, you know, I want to work with this group because we share the same values, we share the same principles. At the end of the day, that's everything to me. At least now, I have more partners to help lessen the load, lighten the load, and it allows me to do this, which is now becoming my principal function as business development and trying to keep up with the expectation that I am the visionary of the firm. I'm supposed to lead the direction of the whole group towards towards new levels of success. There's pressure in that as well. One of the problems due to growth is because a lot of people are new, they need to be reminded of the basic principles. Sometimes we overlook this, me and my senior partners, because we've been together for seven going eight years already. I think the level of understanding is impeccable. The level of teamwork is so high. There's a certain fingertip feel 
towards trust and work that you develop over the years that makes work so much easier. And one of the problems I realize is that this fingertip feel is felt by us partners, but not by the lieutenants, not by our senior associates. And it's highly imperative that they get to the same level of understanding as us because they are next in line to become the next partners, to become the next department heads or business heads of the many different outfits that we are trying to look into as a group. Because apart from the law firm now, as a separate entity, we also have a real estate arm that is a separate entity that is now branched into several different real estate businesses. So right now we have Tierra Pro Real Estate Solutions, which focuses on servicing the back end of real estate. So we do titling and transfers of title, consolidation, admin titling, bar conversion, the likes. And we recently opened Tierra Pro Realty and Brokerage. That's where the front end sales aspect of it comes in. And we also have right now Tierra Pro surveys and mappings. So the, the, the goal really, guys, is to have the lieutenants, the senior associates, not just the lawyers, but also our senior business associates, to lead these new ventures or to hold the fort, to hold the fort while we, while we try to you know, expand the business influence of the group. And yeah, I, I think lately I've been having complaints on the system and how it's supposed to work, on how things are and how the results are. And I think it all comes from a misaligned understanding of how we operate as a firm really. And these are the things that I wish to address in this video today. Everybody, especially our senior associates, need a much needed reminder of the base principles that built up LBBF law from inception to where it is today. First and most important, I think, was the understanding that we are playing an infinite sum game. The rules and the policies that we have in the firm all emanate from these principles. And these are our pillars, our guiding rock towards success. And I'd like to start with the first, which is the infinite sum game. We didn't have the proper name for it back then. You know, I got the term infinite sum game from Simon Sinek and from Naval Ravikant when I was watching their podcasts years after, years after we started LBBF Law based on the same principle. So it's a good wrapper to the thought. So we adopted it. In the infinite sum game, it's not a game with a fixed set of rules and a fixed set of time and a fixed set of players. The point of the game is to keep on playing. So in an infinite sum game, everybody can be winners. It's taken in contrast to a zero-sum game where in order to, for someone to win, somebody else has to lose. In infinite-sum games, and this is what we try to get across to everyone, everybody can be winners. All of us want to be winners in this game that we are playing because we are playing infinite-sum games. So the thought there is that everybody should just add to the pie, make the pie bigger, and get his or her proportional slice of the pie based on the agreement and based on the perceived contribution that you have to the group. One of the problems that I have right now is that some of the people, I think consciously or unconsciously, they want to try to get the most out of the pie already. The biggest slice, if you might, or maybe a bigger slice for themselves, if not the biggest slice. But the problem there is that if you're new to the group, then your priorities should not be how to get the biggest slice, but how to be of use to the group, how to be useful, how to be valuable, how to contribute. It's just like a joining a fraternity where you're in the lowest ranks and you know that the only way up is to be very valuable and to out-contribute everything else. Because we're running a big ship. It's a system, guys. And we see those who are contributing more than they are asking for and we actually reward them. In contrast, we also see those who are asking for higher rewards that outweigh their contribution and we take note of them because these are people who probably don't understand our principles yet and who probably never will. And these are the people we cannot play long-term infinite sum games with. So that's the first principle, the infinite sum game. The second one is that we're playing for tail end gains. And the tail end concept, I got this from Morgan Housel when I was reading Psychology of Money. It's such a beautiful, beautiful encapsulation of the idea that the biggest rewards in life come at the tail end of playing long term games. You know? So, how it is with us, we're not in a hurry. We can have bad months, but we're just playing for the tail end because the point of the game is to keep on playing. And we know that in the tail end, these dividends will pay off for us. These dividends of the seeds that we are planting now. So we're not really focused on the now results. We're just continually 
breaking systems in order for them to grow and planting more seeds every time we get a good harvest. I think this is one of the principles that most of the new guys don't understand. Because if they're running a good month, then they're very happy with the system. But if they run the, a bad month, you know, they act like the system has failed them. They act like, you know, we owe them. We owe them because their hard work did not lead to anything for this month. But guys, we're in private practice. What's important is that you're planting the seeds and you need to learn to play for your own tail end gains as well. Because if you're too impatient, then you end up leaving. And if you leave too early before your harvest comes, then that's not on us. No? Because we have this stubborn belief, crazy to a point, the, the big harvest will come. It's, it's like Noah's Ark in a way that we're just here building because we're waiting for that big rain to come and we can't fault those who don't believe. So this is why principles are so important because if you understand these things as crystal clear as we do, then you wouldn't have to spend time second-guessing yourself, complaining, which brings us to the third principle, failing forward. When we started the law firm, it was just me and Paul and we weren't really exceptional students in our class. We weren't really hotshot new lawyers. We were nobodies. What we had going for us then was a clear understanding of the first two principles, which is that we were playing an infinite sum game and we were playing for the tail end benefits of a long term game. And the third one naturally came to us failing forward because we weren't afraid to make mistakes. We didn't have mentors, we didn't have guides. We had only the bold audacity to make mistakes, you know, the confidence to look stupid in front of other people's eyes. As stupid as I look in front of your eyes right now, guys, I know a lot of you are judging me. This is starter me level. But 100 episodes in, you know, I'm sure I would have had my lighting improved already. I would have had the backdrop improved already. I would have had, you know, researched on the audio, found my true voice. I'm willing to make the mistakes now in order to iterate and improve in the future. That's what I don't understand with most of our juniors, most of our seniors today, is that I'm getting a lot of complaints, to be very honest, about us not being able to lead them as lawyers, as litigation lawyers, because historically, we have made the pivot out of litigation and into other businesses. So the work that we're doing now is not really lawyer work in the strict sense of the word. No, 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 not in the strict sense of the word. In the commonly understood sense of the word because we're no longer attending hearings we're no longer attending to cases personally and for that reason we can't guide them that's something quite brave you know for someone to say very publicly being the head of the firm being the first name on on the wall somebody who's not as updated as the other lawyers in the firm with respect to litigation but it is what it is you know so why should i be afraid to say it during our time guys mind you during our time we had a good three to four years where we were practicing law. We were going to hearings. We were attending hearings. We were submitting pleadings. We were filing new cases and moving cases along. We didn't have a mentor back then. We relished each mistake, painful as it was. And we tried to make sense of everything on our level. That was the premium that we saw. Because we didn't have a mentor, we had a chance to work the way we would have wanted to build the company. And I think that's the founder mentality that not everyone who's following in our footsteps have. I can't fault other people if they wish to be guided, but failing forward has always been our bedrock, one of our base principles in the firm. And in fact, we even have it better now because the system is there. The system is running on the back end compared to in our time when we had to build the system from scratch, make all the mistakes in order to improve so it could become the system that it is today. At least they have the guiding principles because these guiding principles, we built this, guys, layer by layer. We didn't start with six principles and code book when we started the LBBF law. We iterated, made mistakes, and developed the necessary beliefs in order for us to grow. And for the seniors right now, to have the base principles, and you need a bit of failing forward yourselves, guys. I think our senior associates or junior associates, they're amazing lawyers, and they have the potential to become even more amazing. But the mentorship model, it's not something that we've run with since year one. And now we have an external mentorship on principles and on a bit of the business side of it. But this is something that I wish to see 
in a lot of my colleagues. I wish for them to develop and to realize that, you know, developing yourself is hard and building a practice is hard. But if you fail forward and just be willing to go out there, do the thing, make the mistake and learn from it, then mentorship for me is not really necessary because we made it without mentors. My wife, who is now a prolific makeup artist in her own respect, she started out without a mentor, just had lots of practice and a good feedback loop, lots of opportunities to do the right thing, as well as lots of opportunities to do the wrong thing and a strong feedback loop. So better systems we could provide, we could talk about it, but mentors, I don't know, it's a bit incongruous congruent with the principles that we are used to as senior partners. So that's a point of alignment there for everyone who's trying to follow our footsteps and become the next partners of the firm. I hope you make it, guys. The third one is the tether principle. Despite all of our differences in the way we think, despite all of our differences in the way we work, what has really strung us together and allowed us to work together harmoniously at that for the past seven going eight years is the tether principle which is that at the end of the day, you take away everything, you take away the rank, you take away the responsibilities, the good and the bad. All of us are friends. We invited the people who are in our organization right now because at the base of it all, we like to work with them and we like them as a person. You know, I think everybody in the firm is a good person and you have the capability of bringing out more good into the world and we are just here to accompany you in your journey. We are your tribe. And we are your support system. We are your backbone. This particularly comes into play. This was more important back then. I don't know if this finds practical application in the present day. But back then, there was no established hierarchy. All of us, all of us were of the same rank. We didn't have mentors, if you remember, guys. If your colleague won't point out your mistake, then how are you supposed to be aware? How are you supposed to learn? So the tether principle was like our fail-safe. That if somebody says something bad about you to your face... He's not trying to embarrass you in front of other people. He's not trying to demean you. He's not trying to undermine your position or authority in the firm. Maybe he just really made a mistake. All of the different interpretations of this act should be construed in favor of friendship. This was a rule that we had and a rule that we are, admittedly, we're forgetting to pass down to the next generation. One action could be capable of many different interpretations. Like, for example, you're sweeping the floor because you want the room to be tidy. One person, a colleague of yours in your office, could see you sweeping the floor and think, oh, it's good that he's sweeping the floor. It's good that he's mindful enough to want to have a tidy atmosphere for all of us. But another person could look at you and say, look at this guy. He's sweeping the floor to rub it to our faces that we are disorganized 30 people. It's his way of insulting us by sweeping the floor. Or another person could say, look at this guy. He's sweeping the floor because the boss is around. What a kiss ass. That's three totally different but perfectly valid human interpretations because our filters really color how we perceive things. From a base act of sweeping the floor, you can have three or more possible different interpretations in the minds of your colleagues. So that's why the tether principle is important because it reminds us to be a bit more gentle, a bit more forgiving, a bit more understanding of the actions of our colleagues and to resolve all doubts in the favor of friendship. We use this as a, as a tool very early on. We use this as the tool, me with my senior partner. So there are five of us senior partners in the firm right now. Currently, because we might be adding more, but there are five of us right now. Suffice it to say, we don't think the same way. We don't operate the same way. So this tether principle has really helped us grow in understanding of each other's strengths and weaknesses, how we think, how we talk, and what we mean when we say what we say. Yeah, I hope this tool also bridges us with the next generation of leaders, our senior associates, and bridges them with each other. Because guys, in order for us to succeed, all of us need to be all in on this. This is our pie. This is our pie. The next one is meritocracy. So I have this thing shared with my partners that the best idea need not come from the person in charge or the leader of the firm or the one with the highest rank. The best idea could come from our messengers who are out in the field and see things as they are. The best idea could come from our junior lawyers who are in the court hearings experiencing the problems firsthand. A meritocracy simply means we reward the best idea and we reward merit over 
all other considerations, I tell everyone in our firm, everyone can succeed if you really take the time to learn the principles, to improve yourself, and to put in the effort necessary to provide the output that you need to be recognized. And since we are a meritocracy, even senior partner is available to the entry-level station if you just take the time to improve yourself and learn and adapt to the principles of the firm. I can say this with confidence because before we started law firm, we were junior associates in another firm. Attorney Joe, who is my senior partner now, he used to be our paralegal, our runner, when we started LBBF. Now he calls the shots in finance. I take instructions from him as his co-senior partner. Lovely Castaneda, our co-senior partner, she used to be our secretary back in when we were in the real estate department of another company. And she used to be like our admin staff when she joined onboard LBBF. And from there, she really embraced the principles and put in the time and proved herself valuable. Too valuable, in fact, that we had to give her senior partner role for our real estate arm. And see, that's the thing. You don't need to be very, very skilled. You don't need to you know, have the accolades or have the best resume in order to make it big in LBBF. You just need to demonstrate that you are a long-term player, that you are capable of playing the infinite game, that you understand the firm principles, and that you're here to stay for the long haul. As long as you contribute and we see all of that in you, then we have no problem promoting you or giving you higher stations in the firm. More responsibility usually equals to more accountability and more earnings. The next one is radical truth and radical transparency. We've established this early on since we work in different stations. We don't really see each other every day. You need to fully trust your partners because I'd rather operate as fully trusting of someone than spend a lot of time unnecessarily double-checking, triple-checking on the transactions of my partners, you know, afraid that somebody might be siphoning off money from the system. If you play on that, then you don't progress as fast as you want. Because instead of working towards the common goal, then you're working to find faults in other people. So you need radical truth and radical transparency. And I got this, guys. It's actually a lesson that I had. I read it from Charles Duhigg's Smarter, Better, Faster. The story was that they were doing studies on emergency rooms in the UK. They were tracking data and looking at the metrics and different emergency rooms had different number of incident reports. So their first assumption was that the emergency room with more incident reports would lead to higher mortality rate, fatality rate, vis-a-vis the emergency rooms with lower incident reports. But as they started gathering the data across many, many, many emergency rooms across the country, they were surprised to find that the emergency rooms with higher incident reports actually had a better survivability rate than the emergency rooms with low incident reports. And at first, they couldn't explain this, why this was so. But later on, they came to realize that the emergency rooms with higher incident reports had higher respect for transparency and honesty, meaning the environments were inversely not toxic, that people who made mistakes were willing to admit to them making mistakes so they can get that feedback loop and improve upon it in the future, which led to saving more lives than the emergency rooms who would not report their incident reports, their mistakes, for fear of being ridiculed or lambasted or bashed because they were in fact the toxic environments. And because they did not have that feedback loop, a lot more patients died in their emergency rooms. So that's the lesson there. Probably this isn't a principle, but if you want to bring it all together, we have the infinite sum game, the long-term game, failing forward, the tether principle, meritocracy, radical truth, and radical transparency. So the last thing, guys, the last thing that this isn't actually a principle, but it's a practice. It's something that we do in the law firm. And this is where a lot of the new guys don't understand. Back then, how we grew was we grew a small pot. And once it grew big enough, ripe for harvest, as you would, then we'd break it. We'd actually break the system, divert it into two different funds, and now start to grow these like little saplings of new businesses until individually, they would be self-sufficient. And now we'd have two streams of income. We did this internally with our law firm. And we did this with the real estate firm moving forward. So like, for example, real estate, everything started with one pot. And then we had the building administration. So we started servicing building administration and parking administration 
for some of our real estate clients. For a time, it was in the main pot. And the main pot was big. We were enjoying the benefits of having a big pot because, you know, you take home more at the end of the day. But we decided to break this pot and operate parking and building administration separately from the real estate main. When this happens, the real estate main, naturally, it loses some of its income stream because we've diverted it into an independent business. We're trying to grow this independently, meaning self-sufficient. It should be the one uh, paying salaries and rent and utilities for its own operations. And this one would necessarily lose the income stream that we splintered as well. After that, both little saplets or seedlings grew again and we had to break it again. So this time, the real estate main, we broke it into the front-facing Tierra Pro Realty and Brokerage and the back-facing Tierra Pro Real Estate Solutions. And since we splintered this, we splintered this pot, of course, income goes down for a bit. And then gradually it recovers after things have stabilized within the systems. And now we have three sources of income on what would have been just one business, one business line. And now we're splintering solutions further to accommodate surveys and mappings as a different business. So now the thing here is that every time you break a system, all problems surface. But after you solve all of the problems, then you'd be enjoying stable income from two systems, three systems, four systems now, instead of just having it all clumped up into one. And I think the sort of streamlining, we adopted this with the law firm. When we decided to break the system, it was going pretty well, and then we decided to add 10 lawyers. And I wanted to prove something to my partners, to the lawyers already in the firm, that if you want to succeed, you have to be willing to do the radical extreme. If you follow the path of the other law firms, just the normal path, what would be our differentiator then? We'd just be like them. And I wanted to be different. I wanted to test assumptions on the bleeding edge of possibility. That's why I recruited 10 new lawyers to the firm. Right now, this is where the brunt of the challenge comes from because we're really still adjusting, even seven, eight months into it. We are adjusting not because of the work system, but because of the belief system. I think a lot of people up to now still don't believe in me, still don't believe in the vision, in the plan. That's the problem that I have right now. How to explain to these people? Because the people who don't believe don't see what I see. They're not reading the source material that I'm reading. And they don't get the 100% view of the concept that I'm seeing. So this is the problem. People would complain about the system we're trying to build. And they fail to understand why we're making decisions in a certain way. But the thing is, I think these people see only one, two, three, four, five, ten factors. I mean, based on those ten factors, then the decision they would want us to take is actually the sound decision. It's the right decision based on those ten factors. What I'm saying is, as head of the firm, I'm looking at 60 to 100 different factors. And if this is the correct decision based on the ten factors, then this is the balanced correct decision if you view the hundred factors. And that's why it's radically different from the way you would want the decision to be made, to be carried out, to be executed. That's the thing. So there's this quote from Ray Dalio. He actually posted this today. And he said, you can get the great life that you want, but you can't get it in exactly the way you imagine you want it. And this is something I have learned because I'm very idealistic myself. And I understand that the way I'm wired comes with its own advantages and it comes with its own disadvantages. And I have learned that the way my partners are wired, they're wired differently than me, but we need to have that clash of ideas to refine the idea and to come up with a solution. And it's enough for me now to get the objective. It doesn't need to be the way I imagined how it would be done, but it's now enough for me that it is actually done. So let me just read Ray Dalio's comments on it. If you, th if you think about what you want most in your life in a big picture, strategic way rather than a particular tactical way, you can almost certainly get the life that suits you. On the other hand, if you're very particular and tactical, you almost certainly will not get the life you want. That is because there are many paths to the life that you want, and in fact, to a better life than you can imagine, but not the exact path that you have in your mind. That is because nothing goes exactly as planned and you aren't yet knowledgeable enough 
to be precise and single-minded in saying that you want to have exactly that. That's a bonus principle that I want to add to this talk. And I think one of the problems we have is that as senior partners, we're not doing enough effort to pass these principles along to the next in line, to our lieutenants. We call them our lieutenants, our senior associate lawyers, and our senior business associates. Maybe we lack effort to pass these principles along to get them in the same plane of understanding as us. In the same vein, maybe they lack the effort to meet us halfway. A lot of people complain that they want a certain thing in our system done a certain way. But if they didn't take the time, you know, to read the source material that we have for our principles, you know, the base Naval, the base Hormozy, the base Ray Dalio, the base Culture Code, and the many other books, the base Morgan Housel, these are our source material. You don't have to hear it from me. You don't need, as a member of LBBF, you're not required to watch this podcast episode, but you should at least read the source material before you try to contribute to make sure that your values are aligned with ours. Because to contribute on a policy-making level requires an alignment of values. Because at the end of the day, that's our, that's our base. You know, that's why we call it our pillars, our bedrock. You're not studying enough. You're not studying enough, guys. And you're not taking the effort to learn. You should not just work in the business, but work on the business as well. We're in this together. And you honing your understanding of the principles is as important as you working. Another problem that I wish to highlight with our lieutenants, our members of the firm, is that everybody wants to be great in the least possible amount of time, sort of in a hurry. But not everyone is willing to train. I don't get it. I really don't get it. We developed a gold line system because how are you supposed to measure if a lawyer is a good lawyer? I mentioned before that running a law firm is like a talent management and acquisition business. And how are you supposed to measure what makes a good lawyer when you can't put metrics into that data? You can't analyze how one pleading is better than another pleading in terms of scorecard. We don't have that scoring metric and data available to us now. So what we did develop is something called the gold line system. So the gold line system is actually our system to track the lagging measures of the firm. So each lawyer gets to participate and it's sort of our attempt to gamify the system, to gamify learning and growth and development. So the gold line system, we have certain activities programmed, beneficial of course to the lawyer's performance output. We have Manning in our offices, attendance in our meetings, a uh, list of accredited podcasts, and articles, new client meetings, and growth and strategy sessions with their colleagues. So each activity has its corresponding maximum limit and corresponding number of points, leading to 100. What we do is the one scoring 90 to 100, that's the gold line. That's like super excellent. You're a role model. You should be emulated. Your hard work should be rewarded. For that sprint cycle, which is basically a month, you are the best lawyer out there playing the game. What we do is like we have 16 manning instances as the maximum. We have eight meetings, four podcasts a month, four articles a month, 10 new client meetings a month, and 20 growth and strategy sessions with your colleagues. The thing here is that this actually increases the bonding within the firm and increases the tactics level of it because instead of like trying to be voodoo juju about it on how to become a better lawyer, we decided to assign points and just gamify it, you know, because if you do more client meetings, then you will end up with more clients. If you write articles per month, then you will end up with a good battery, a good repertoire of articles for clients to find you and for you to improve on your own writing skill as well. If you're in the office, work comes to you. That's Manning. If you join the meetings, then you get to develop. That's attendance. If you listen to the podcasts, you get to work on the business, not just in the business. And that helps you grow as well. These things in the gold line, these are all lagging measures. Meaning, you don't get to see the results right away. Just because you had an 80-point month, which is a blue line for us. So the scoring is actually gold, blue, green, and red. If you're in the red, that means you had a poor showing this month of the lagging measures that we have. And they're lagging measures because you don't see the result right away. You see it like four or five months, six months into the future, but you know that you built it on the day. That's, that's the difference between a lagging measure and a lead measure. This is a productivity tip, but this is what I'm doing, is that I put all the lagging measures as objectives 
So the manning, the attendance, the podcasts, the articles, new client meetings, growth and strategy sessions, we're all up there as objectives. But as lead measure, every day, I have a habit tracker that I'm starting now, this month of August. Every day, I want to wake up early, like get two blocks of deep work, go to the gym and exercise, start work at 8 to 8.30, get another six good work blocks in, write on my gratitude journal, work on my content, and prepare for the next day, and sleep early. If I do that, I mark everything as like perfect day, and that's my lead measure. Over the course of time, I try to work on the lagging measures, but on the day-to-day, I just need to make sure I'm getting my lead measures in. Like more input, more output. That should be the like dumbest, easiest strategy to follow. So I don't want to be an optimizer. I want to be a maximizer this year. That's the subject for a different podcast episode. Back to the problem of willingness to train. You can't say you want to be good at basketball, but you don't want to do the drills. You don't want to do the strength conditioning exercises. You don't want to you know, do the footwork. You don't want to practice shooting all by yourself in an empty gym. You have to go in there and do the work. And that is what makes you a great basketball player, not playing basketball every day. You need the feedback loop. That what, that's what makes an expert. Dedication towards doing the same thing over and over and over again with a tight feedback loop on how to improve on the minute details, you know, the nuances, the pulse of the shot, you know, the movement, the positioning in the feet, everything. I'm not saying this because I'm a basketball player, but it's the example everybody relates to. I do play Dota, and I have been playing Dota since it was Dota 1. And you know what? I'm just an average player. You know why? Because I don't do replay analysis. Every time I get to play, I'm just like, oh, you know, I don't really want to improve. I just want to have a game, play, and... I am very aware that this is why I don't get better. Because I know people who are pro, semi-pro at this virtual game, they do a lot of replay analysis. They try to go over their mistakes, the mistakes of other professional players. They really like play by play, break it down and try to analyze it and try to implement it in the next game that they play. So as lawyers, you can't just say you want to be a great lawyer, guys. You can't just say you want to be a good businessman. You can't just say you want to be great at everything, but be unwilling to do the training. These things in our gold line system, this is your Mr. Miyagi wax on, wax off. It may not make sense on the day-to-day, but know that it's a lagging measure. You don't see the results of it till six months to a year after. That's why it doesn't make sense. But if you do believe and you do do it, then you will be the one to reap the rewards and the benefits of your own hard work. But you must be willing to train. You must be willing to put in the points, you know. You can't complain that the system is failing you on the months that you're not doing good. Now that we see the points and we see that you're not pulling your own weight. For the July sprint cycle, I finished second. I was a blue liner with 69.5 points. And I was a tad bit disappointed. I wanted to finish fifth or sixth. I wanted to have the more active lawyers finish with better points than me because it meant that number one, they believed in the system and number two, they were willing to do the work necessary in order to improve, improve themselves and improve their own outputs. And what I'm seeing now that I'm number two of our July gold line system, it means that a lot of the other lawyers, they're not taking this seriously. That's on you guys. You know what happens to those who don't believe. You don't stick around for the tail end gains. This isn't a joke. For me, I try to work seriously as I can. You know, I'm not the most reliable worker, player out on the field, but I am one of the most intense. I will try to get the gold line in the months to come. Right now, devising my own strategy and how to do it. Because you can't want to be great and not be willing to train. That's just, I don't understand that. I hope, I hope I get this lesson across to the people within the group who are listening. Which leads me to the next problem. The lack of belief. The lack of belief in the system. I discussed this in the previous podcast episode. There are actually five stages to every opportunity. To really succeed in any opportunity. Any opportunity. And you need to get to stage four. Consider this. You joined the law firm because you were sold that you were coming into a good opportunity. In fact, In truth and in fact, it was. So you join the law firm and you start working or you join the real estate firm and you start working. Fair. You are in the stage of uninformed optimism. You got sold on the idea that this would be a good opportunity. And then you stay for a year or two years and you start to see all the problems pop up. And then you think to yourself, ah, this wasn't what I signed up for. And now you're in the second phase of every good opportunity, which is informed pessimism. From uninformed optimism, you're now at the face of informed pessimism. 
and you need to get to stage four in order to succeed. So now, now that you're aware of all the pitfalls, all the challenges, all of the things that are not working right, then you get thrust to the valley of despair. And once you're in the valley of despair, you now second guess yourself. Is this really the right opportunity for me? You know, am I really with the right? Will this group really bring me towards the success that I was promised? Am I not better off exploring another opportunity? Because right at this point, you get to see other opportunities and you say, why would I stay here if I could do the better thing over there? That looks like a better opportunity there. That looks like a better opportunity there. So other people, when they get to stage three, and by the way, stage three is called the valley of despair. Other people, when they get to stage three, they quit, they give up or they go chase the better opportunity. But what they don't realize is that once you get to the better opportunity, quote unquote, you are in stage one of that opportunity, which is uninformed optimism. Because the truth of the matter is, guys, succeeding is hard. You know, everything is shit. If succeeding were easy, then everyone would have been successful by now. Consider that. Why is it like only the creme a la creme of the world's population is successful? It's because succeeding is damn hard. It's very hard. It's hard if you do it alone. It's hard if you do it with a group. Those who made it easy, either we don't see the sacrifices that they went through, or they're really lucky. There are really lucky people in this planet. But you can't rely on luck. You can't rely on luck. You want luck to come to you because you stir the pot long enough. Luck needs preparation, that sort of thing. The thing is, if only you'd had soldiered through your valley of despair, you'd get to the fourth stage, which is now informed optimism. So uninformed optimism, informed pessimism, valley of despair, informed optimism, wherein you can say, okay, these are the problems that I'm facing. This is how I solve the problem so I can proceed. And only when you get to that mind frame, that frame of mind, that, that mindset, that situation, can you move to the fifth stage of opportunity, which is actually reaping the success that you have sown. And that's why, for me, belief system is so important because if you don't believe in yourself, if you don't believe in the principles, if you don't believe in the system, you're out when you get to stage three. When you get your own value of despair and you second guess the whole thing, the whole experience, your own decisions, whether you fit in or not, whether this is the right group or not, whether this is the right system or not, if you don't believe, naturally you'd face yourself out. That's why, for me, belief system is everything. I posted this on my Facebook account, on my Instagram, just last night. Allow me to read my own post, guys. Belief system is everything. I'll say it once, but I'll repeat it as much as I have to until the lesson gets across to everyone. Following in our footsteps in our organization and for everyone trying to figure it out on their own, Belief system is everything. Me and my partners, there's truly nothing exceptional about us. None of us are exceptionally smart. Neither are we exceptionally skilled as far as lawyers go. We don't have a secret sauce or an ace up our sleeve. No unfair advantage. What we do have, on the other hand, is clear and super simple. We operate on a system of principles. We've set up long-term goals to reach, and we actually believe we can achieve them no matter how long it takes us. And because all of us believe we are allowed to pay for our success in the golden currency that 99% of other people are unwilling to afford. Time. We have been willing to spend more time than others working as one team, doing the same thing and trying to make ourselves better at it. Not sure if our success lies at the next turn or the next hundred or the next thousand, but stubborn enough to endure despite the many hardships and failures along the way. See, starting and running a business is hard. It's so difficult, in fact, that most people give up before they even start to see results, before they cross the plateau of latent potential, in the valley of despair where everyone else throws in the hat to chase the allure of the next green pasture. Your belief in your system, your principles, and the likelihood that your team will achieve the heights of success would be the principal impetus that carries you through. That's why for us, having a strong belief system and belief in the system is virtually everything. What is skill? What is talent? Skillful players come and go, but the player who believes will always choose to stay. Through the hardships and the doubts, until he grows to be deserving. If there's one thing I credit the most to our core group's accomplishments, it is that we have been willing to spend the necessary time with each other, soldiering through every low and riding the occasional high, patiently honing our craft in the unified stubborn belief that we can succeed together. In the years to come, 
others will know. Time makes all the difference. Guys, me and my partners, we had our own valley of despair, each of us at different times. What carried us through really was the crazy belief that we will make it. And this crazy belief is difficult to ask of everyone because it requires a leap of faith. It requires for you to put your full trust, though your understanding might not be complete yet. Trust that you are in the same boat as we are. We are playing the infinite sum game. So we are actually working towards your success as much as we are working towards our own. No other group could say this with as much sincerity and with as much conviction as the group that we are in, LBBF Law and Hero Pro Real Estate. I work every day to make sure my partners succeed. I work every day to make sure our staff have a good living, our stakeholders, everybody is improving, our lawyers. We work to provide a good livelihood, a good life for everyone. And that's not nothing, guys. That's not nothing. We are now providing livelihood to more than 40 people and counting. And it's not as easy as back in the day when we were just trying to make it three, five of us, six of us, eight of us. Now the organization is big. I need you to help. And you can start helping by reaching out, trying to understand these principles and putting all hands on them. We need to earn for other people. And because we are tethered, as long as other people earn, then we ourselves earn. I don't look at my own earnings. Some months, even the junior lawyers out-earn me, outperform me. Some months, even the senior lawyers out-earn me, outperform me. I don't have other businesses. So consistently every month, some of my partners who have other businesses out-earn me, outperform me. I don't care. I am playing the long-term infinite sum game, waiting for my tail end game to arrive. I hope you understand that as much as we understand that. We hope that you'll be more reaching out as we are as open to explaining this to you. And if you're not part of the organization, if you're watching, I hope you learned something new today. I hope you join us in the Yellow Pill Society. It's actually a forum and school trying to spread these principles because we want to work with partners. We want to work with clients and companies who believe in the same things that we do, operate in the same way that we do, more or less. And we believe that if we band together, we can make everybody succeed, everybody within our respective groups. And if everybody is successful, we have room to grow in influence and strength. And we can change the world in the little way that we can. Or maybe our impact could transform from a ripple to a wave and touch as many lives as possible. It would be a good and worthwhile contribution of a lifetime. This is Miguel Mapas, and I hope you enjoyed watching episode 2 of the Yellow Pill Podcast. If you haven't already, please click subscribe and like. If you click like, it would show other people that this is good shit and hopefully share it. The algorithm would pick it up. I don't know. I'll see you in the next podcast. I'll try to be as honest as possible. I hope it's probably an hour or so. I hope you weren't bored. This is a one-way conversation. Hopefully, we will have more two-way conversations. You can always comment at school. Um, I'll drop the link below. First comment. Thank you guys for watching and I'll see you in the next Yellow Pill podcast.